Wow, this is a big topic. Um, uh, in, in many, many ways, uh, I'm relatively new to MIT, all of uh, nine to ten months, so any errors I make, I, I, I put on that, my naivety on exactly what goes on, but whatever, I'm in charge, so I take responsibility. Um, uh, I was at the University of Illinois, so although we don't have public university here, I very much have in my heart uh, a University of Illinois, a state, a land-grant university, and all of the things uh, that they had to deal with in terms of intellectual property, economic development, as a mission of their university. What I've got today, uh, and, and I'm pleased to say I don't answer directly any of the questions already posited or the, or the uh, considerations to be given, but I do offer some perspective and some additional information, which I hope you'll find interesting. So uh, we have a quandary. I think that's clear. Um, there are many, many things about intellectual property that make it complex. Uh, universities tend, uh, you know, they are focusing on uh, teaching and research and, uh, and service in many ways. Economic development in some cases is a mission. Um, I know that uh, President Reif says, you know, we are first about uh, teaching, we are second about research, and we are third about innovation. And he considers that to be the priority order. That said, we have many, many things going on at MIT that speak to innovation and entrepreneurship, as, as David met, mentioned at, at BC as well. Um, I want to just, uh, not that anyone needs any teaching on this, but uh, a recent report uh, that M Michelle Lee, now I believe confirmed as the USPTO director, um, put out, which was talking about IP in the US economy. Um, and, you know, these are no, no new statements to you. Incentives uh, to invent and create, uh, uh, pr uh, protecting in innovators from unauthorized copying, facilitating vertical specialization, platform for national investments, uh, supporting liquidity through mergers, uh, supporting licensing-based technology, business models, basically what universities try to do, and enabling uh, a more efficient market. One could argue with some of those things in terms of how effective they are, but I, I kind of wanted to put it up there and then match it with, you know, how important IP intensive industries are to this country and the fact that universities are often the driver of innovation. Now, whether or not they are effective in that is an open question, I think, but they are, I believe, trying to do the best they can with the tools they're given and the funding that they have and the resources that are uh, uh, applied to that. So what are the concerns? And I, I actually find this really interesting because I, I, I got a book a couple of uh, months ago called The Branding of the American Mind, How Universities Capture, Manage, and Monetize Intellectual Property and Why It Matters. And it's not particularly complimentary about the work that I do or my colleagues in terms of what it's trying to achieve, but it speaks directly to some of the content of this, uh, of this um, uh, workshop, which is... Uh, you know, engaging in tech transfer is effectively a clashing of missions, um, money-related goals and mission-related goals to do with teaching, research, and uh, getting um, uh, uh, knowledge out there. And the, the, next, the next paragraph to this one in this book said, universities that own patent may be tempted to license them on an exclusive basis to only one company, as opposed to licensing them cheaply and non-exclusively to anyone willing to pay for a license. Well, I would take issue with that second part. That sounds arbitrary. I mean, I think what we should be talking about is the structure of licenses and how it's done and what's most effective and what's most valuable for society in the way that we do that, as opposed to arbitrarily licensing them cheaply and non-exclusively. And maybe it's just the tone that, that got me on that. But clearly, there is an issue here and the concerns exist. And there are universities that don't have the skill set or they don't have some of the capabilities or the tools to help them in that mission. So talking of missions, we happen to have been um, working at MIT TLO on developing our mission statement because when I got there, I discovered we had two mission statements, one on the website and one in one of our books. And I thought, hmm, we can fix that. <laughs> That's an early win. Um, uh, but it's still, I, I'm actually presenting it at the, uh, t uh, at our all staff meeting tomorrow, so I'm not going to present it to you beforehand because that would be a big no-no. Um, but, but in doing that, we decided to look at other universities' mission statements just out of interest to see the language that they used and where their focus was. Now, there were some really short ones. We aim to please our customers or we aim to patent technologies, which is a little, uh, a little slim. Um, but I thought it interesting, and again, not to, not to, I'm not taking issue with any of these, but 
the intent, and if we call it the heart of what tech transfer offices are trying to do, is about translation. The words that came up were to do with um, making available and beneficial to society, societal benefit, fostering economic development, promoting economic growth. So I'd say that the true heart of tech transfer often is trying to do better, trying to do good. Now, whether or not we achieve that, we can actually question and we can get into that later. But if you look at the, the, the mission statements, and if you don't believe in mission statements, fine. But it's supposed to speak to the vision and the values of an, uh, of an organization. And, it, and in doing that, I thought, well, we actually stole some of the words. There were some that we completely ignored uh, in order to um, kind of um, uh, get to the heart of what the MIT TLO about, which is truly about trying to have impact in society. This, and I'm jumping all over the place just to keep you on your feet, make sure you don't fall asleep. Um, this is actually a, a, a graphic that's on the Association of University Tech Managers website, and it is a pictorial of the output from the 2015 annual survey that they do every year, and it's a one place that everybody goes to see whether or not tech transfer is successful and who's the best. Best, what does that mean? I'll, we'll talk about that later as well. Um, but I thought it was interesting because it gave a sense of how much impact is being had in any one year. And then I thought, well, that's a cute graphic, but does it really speak to what's been going on over, over a number of years? And so what I did, and you'll have to excuse the crude graphics and my attempt at animation if it fails, my apologies in advance. But so I took 15 years and I said, okay, what's gone into this system? Uh, so this is all from the Association of University Tech Managers uh, surveys. And I think about 190 to 200 universities subscribe in any one year and actually answer the questions asked of them. So Tech Transfer is managing the output from 492 billion in federal funds, 225 billion in estate and other foundation funds, and about 56 billion in industry funding. So that's kind of like our feedstock. From that, we've received, and again, during this period, uh, 300,000 invention disclosures. And again, whether or not you find this interesting, I thought it was a good starting place for you know, the base of what we're talking about. In terms of what we're doing with that, we're spending $4.3 billion on protecting that. Some wisely, perhaps some unwisely, another question. And recovering $2 billion of that, 46%. And it's commonly known across all universities that we run a loss on what we invest and what we recover through licenses. And I always call that our at-risk portfolio, the price we pay to have a shot on goal, and one can define goal, um, in order to try and get technologies out to protect them in order that somebody else will invest in them. Because it's not an end game, patenting something. Everybody knows that. From that, we see about 67,000 US patents issued. I see the USPTO writing this down. He's probably going to go back and check my stuff afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've got, so that's the, the issued patents. And from that, we see about 62,000 licenses, options executed. That's, the, again, this is from the data. And from that, we receive 31 billion in licensing income. That excludes, I, I deducted the patent reimbursements, which are also considered license income, but so it's three, 33 billion, but two, two billion of that is patent reimbursements. Now this is where I did some math, so my apologies if I got this wrong and I'm going way out there with this, but I said, okay, well, what, what does that mean? That's income. Where did it come from? So I did a little calculation and I said, okay, if, and I think if everybody looks at all their licenses, typically we are seeing anything from point of a percent to 5% of royalty being taken on net sales. And I said, okay, let me just use 2%. So 2% of net sales equals 31 billion. So net sales were in the region of 1,550 1, sales revenue in the economy leading to that revenue. So what does that mean, Leslie? I don't have a clue, but it speaks to... What, what we're dealing with, what we're managing, what we're trying to make sense of, and how we're trying to get technologies out there. $1,550 billion of sales revenue isn't um, a bad job, in my view. Again, you can define all of that. However, 
Let's talk about the real story behind tech transfer. And I don't have any uh, newer data, but 2012, the top 5% five, 5 earners, this is not the greatest language, but eight universities took 50% of the X billion dollars that is earned. The top 10%, 16 universities, and that will probably include MIT and Stanford and Columbia and a few others, took nearly three quarters of the system's income. And the truth is, 84% of universities in 2012 did not make enough money to cover their operating costs. And over the previous 20 years, 87% did not break even. So if we were investors, why the hell would we be doing this? So my question is, I really believe those mission statements. Or not my question. My statement is, I believe those mission statements because nobody in their right mind would invest in something that only 13% of the time was going to give them an ROI or a positive ROI. All right, changing again. Just keeping you on your toes. Next, we're going to be doing jumping jacks, so watch out. Um, so MIT... Uh, it, 800 invention disclosures. I can't complain about it. I'd love to, but everybody else would slap me around the head and say, we are barely getting things in the door. We can't engage with our faculty. They're so hard to work with. We have to stop them at the door and say, could you please make sure that you actually have an invention before you come to us? Or an idea beyond a concept. We think you're great. I know you want to start a company, but that piece of paper doesn't do it for us. Um, this is our, this is kind of our, our, our world. And I, I, I wanted to break into this just a little more. Um, in our portfolio, we have over 2,500 U.S.-issued patents, and 50% of those are licensed. I don't know the stats for the rest of the world, but I think that's pretty good. It may not be great, but it's pretty good. We've got 50% of patents licensed. Of the pending apps, we have about 31% licensed. Of those that issued just this year, we have 217 already, and of those, 41% are licensed. I am always looking at that sort of statistic to see whether or not we are out there doing things with the stuff that we have that is current, that is just about to be issued, that we should be working on to try and find the right partner to get the technology into the marketplace. And the, and the FY17 disclosures to date, we've uh, received probably around 300. This is just a breakdown of the areas. People sometimes don't know that we do receive a lot of life sciences, and Lauren Foster is here who heads up that group, uh, technologies, but they're not in the typical therapeutic areas. We are dealing with many, many other things. I know she's going to be talking about that later on, particularly medical devices and the like. And you notice I'm not seeing anything about Mm -mm -mm. Um, because uh, I, uh, that, that is a topic I know is going to come up later. Now, the other thing, again, jumping again to a different topic, and a question that is often asked these days is, what are you doing with sponsored research, and who ever licenses that stuff? Well, here's a little analysis. 343 inventions arising out of sponsored research that came in between FY03 and FY12 for MIT, 53% is, remains unlicensed. 10% was exclusively licensed to the sponsor. 15% was non-exclusively licensed to the sponsor. More and more they're asking for those royalty-free or capped fees or something non-exclusively. 11% jointly owned but no license. Probably them saying that's enough, that's all we need. And 11% licensed to another party. And the struggle we have at the moment is that relationship with the sponsor and how we get those technologies out. Because if they're not interested in them, often they're seen as a bear at the door and it's hard to actually get someone else interested. I, I challenge that in some ways because I think we need to make decisions about how to better uh, structure that to get the technologies into the hands of others without feeling as though they're going to be undermined. So my last slide, and, and this is really shallow. I mean, given all of the things that you said before, Yarden and, and David, you were talking about as well, is like, what considerations do we have as we're licensing technology, as we're protecting technology, as we're functioning as a tech transfer office, as we're thinking philosophically about our role in a university? One is that what we are dealing with is so embryonic. Some of the stuff probably shouldn't be patented. We are sometimes putting broad patents in place that we shouldn't even be thinking about putting a piece of paper around. And expectation setting. Our faculty who think that when they su submit to us, we should immediately get a piece of paper for them and begin the, the, the route to uh, the patent office. I don't believe that we should. I think there's a big cultural issue there. Um, and it's not because 
folks at MIT or any place else these days want to hang these things on their wall, it actually speaks to the role of tech transfer officers beyond patenting, helping start companies, helping uh, students, um, moving into this other other domain where biz dev and all of these other cool things are happening, NSF, i um, you know, the things that are really bridging the gap, tech transfer offices are being pulled into that more and more. And then the reduction in federal funding that is really pushing, it's the real reason that I put in the sponsored research slide, towards corporate sponsored research. But we don't seem to be doing that very well either because we're not getting the engagement we need. And, and there's a whole load of questions around that. Is it the corporate uh, uh, sponsors? Is it our structure of licenses? What, what is it about that? What is what, what can we do better there? And then open innovation, which is a huge area of which there are many, many initiatives uh, that we are both participating participating in and trying to work out because open innovation means so many different things to so many people. And that's my slide set. Thank you.